Hi, everybody. I am Maestra Jata Magdalena Alberti, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the Renaissance apothecary. Now, the word for apothecary is spezieria, and so the word is written right on the title slide. Um, I like to practice saying that word um, because it's just a, a fun word to say, and it was a fun word for me to discover. So I want to share with you everything I've discovered in my research of the Renaissance apothecary. So we're going to jump right in and talk about what does specieria mean. And it comes from uh, the word spice. The word spice is spezia. So pharmacies in the Italian Renaissance um, were termed various things from epotiche, spezieria, um, aromatari. Um, these were all words used for pharmacies interchangeably. And they were very important social and commercial um, hubs in the 15th and 16th century of the Italy's. Um, at the Spezieria, you could buy herbs, medicine, household goods, spices like um, oregano and basil and sage, the things that we think of when we think of Italian cooking. Also sugar, wax, biscuits, candies, pigments, perfumes. Um, how do I know this? Well, primary source research. Um, for example, we have uh, pharmacia, a pharmacia in Firenze, Florence, that's called the Ospedale degli Innocenti. Innocenti. Switching, from Sp <laughs> switching from English to Italian is really difficult, but the C is always ch, so Innocenti. Now that is a, a pharmacy that's in Firenze, and it contains records of many of the apothecaries uh, of the city and, in the 15th and 16th, 16th century. And in their records, they indicate what was sold, who bought it, and how much they paid for it. Um, next slide. So again, we have evidence that the apothecary shop was a social gathering place. Um, painters bought their pigments there. The wealthy bought medicine, um, also sweets or candles. Um, rumor has it that also political information and popular songs were shared and exchanged alongside people who were buying pills and syrups and taking medicine in, in the shop as far as like teas and tisanes. Um, we have also have records of things like conflicts between customers. Um, for instance, Madalena of Ragusa was, actually it's on the slide, um, at the Aromatario della Luna, uh, Madalena of Ragusa hit the daughter of one of the servants of the Signoria over the head with her shoe, and she was charged a three floor and fine. Again, we know this from primary source records. We're, I'm very happy that they recorded things like this in legal proceedings so that we could know that it wasn't just a place you stood in line and didn't talk to anyone and didn't interact. There were interactions that were pleasant, and there were interactions that were not so pleasant. Um, let's see, next slide. So, Arti Maggiori. The apothecary himself, and I say himself as most, all the records I've seen um, of the apothecaries, they were male, um, belonged to a guild of doctors and apothecaries. And the name of that guild is Medici e Speziali. Um, this photo on the slide is taken from Or San Michel, which is a church that's known in Florence for the sculptures of the gills that surrounds the outside uh, upper area of the church. Um, these were commissioned in the 14th century, and this is actually the, um, the sculpture for the guild of Medici Espeziali, doctors and apothecaries. So, apparatus. What do we find inside the shops? This fresco that you see here is from Castello, uh, Castello Isogne, I believe, and it's, um, it's in Val d'Asta, Italy, and this was painted around the turn of the century, so in about 1500. So what do we learn from this fresco? We learned that inside the shops, we could find things like scales, scala. We could find apothecary jars, alberello or alberelli, plural. Uh, we would find books with information in it on recipes. We'd find herbs. Um, mortar and pestles. Now you can't see it in, the, in this particular shot of the fresco, but if you look at the whole thing in the corner, there's a man on the floor um, with a mortar and pestle grinding something up. 
So you would definitely find those because they were preparing herbs and powders um, to sell people. Um, you also see candles um, and also torches, which are a little bit different and both could be used in um, as votive objects, which are things that they would use for like devotional use. Um, you see that they have tables, uh, shelves in the back, a counter, they would have an alembic there so they could use that to distill things. Um, notice that the woman is the one making the purchase. Um, by the 16th century, women were known to be writing their recipes in still room books. Many dabbled in alchemy. Um, and of course, the lady of the house would have her own recipes for soaps, uh, laundry washes, um, cleansing the body, the hair, the face, making ink. Um, these were things that she would have written down. And we have actually some of those still room books that, we, that have been um, preserved till today. Everything. Oh, also in this, um, in this fresco, I don't know if you can see it clearly on your screen, but hanging from the back along with the candles are um, other objects for devotional use that were called votive objects. So there's a hand hanging down. If, when I first saw it, I thought it was a glove. But it's actually a wooden hand. Um, there's also a human figure, a horse figure in the background, and like a, um, I think that's it. Yeah. Oh, and a leg. There's a leg hanging back there. So if anyone studies that, I would love to talk to you because I'm really kind of curious about what all these devotional um, items were used exactly, how they were used, um, and how they were made. Let's see. So inside the shops. Um, these are close-ups of uh, apothecary jars, Alberelli, and a close-up of a glass alembic, um, close-up of some of the books, the recitario, which is uh, just recipe books, um, and also a 14th century miniature of another apothecary shop with the same types of objects in them. In fact, every depiction I've found of an apothecary shop between 1400 and 1600 on the Italian peninsula, they have the same types of things. They have shelving, they have the apothecary jars, they have scales, they have alembics, etc. So, San Giovanni di Parma. Um, although it was a place for the production of medicines, um, both for use by the monks and for pilgrims that, that passed by, this place has been around since 1201. We know for sure that, you know, that it dates back to 1201, and there, parts of it probably were founded around 980 AD. And by, but by the end of the 15th century, um, this apothecary shop had reached pretty much a professional level to the extent that the, mo the monks there um, took care to purchase these beautiful uh, shelves and furniture and other equipment, which is still there and it's used as a mu museum. So if you ever do visit Italy, and you get to Parma. This is a good apothecary shop to um, go to. It's ancient. Um, all of the, the furnishings are not ancient, but they have dates on most of that when you get there. So next, I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about how you can get started yourself in herbal and apothecary medicine. Um, basically, I got started by playing detective and paying attention. Um, you can also join the Known World uh, Apothecary Guild. Um, there's a Facebook group for that, and you can meet other people who are interested in apothecary arts. Um, but I would also say study things like period herbals, period pharmacopoeia, and books of secrets, because they give you a lot of information on the apparatus used, the types of herbs and ingredients used, how things were prepared, uh, how they divided uh, the use of, say, syrups and elixirs and teas and tisanes and poultices and etc. Um, so we're going to start with this picture. It just has a selection of things that we definitely would find in an apothecary shop. So there's basil there, there's cinnamon, there is uh, clove and ginger, there is lavender, nutmeg, rose petals, sage, and saffron. These are also things that we can buy at you know, our local markets and use in our homes. We can usually find them fresh or dried. So I would say start there. Um, another good place to get your herbs. Another, hold, give me one second. My dog is playing with a very noisy toy. Please don't do that. Thank you. Um, what was I saying? 
Oh, another good place to get dried herbs um, that are organic. So you know you can put you can um, you can ingest them as well as use them for uh, ointments and things that go on your skin and on your hair. Um, is Rose Mountain herbs. They have a really great organic selection of dried herbs. I use them a lot. I really trust them. So this next slide talks about an, something else you would see in an apothecary. Now I talked about the candies and um, the syrups. Mostarda would be something you could probably also find at just about any apothecary shop. It is a condiment. And um, because they would have had the apparatus to make this condiment, um, and they were somewhere people came for things like candies and sweets, they sold this particular thing and I've tasted it. It is a basically a condiment made of candied fruit and a mustard flavor syrup. Um, someone asked, what are the red and yellow pepper looking things that were on the previous picture? Oh, those are, oh, I didn't write that down, did I? So there's long pepper and short pepper. These are short peppers. So the mustarda. Um, so it's one recipe that you'd be able to buy ready-made or buy the ingredients at the, the apothecary to make yourself. Now, traditionally, this would have been um, served with what they call bolito misto, which is boiled mixed meat. So you'd have beef, you'd have hen, capon, veal, boiled and mixed together. And this particular condiment would be put with that to ingest. I've never had that particular combination, the meat and the mustarda, but it's, it's a very Italian thing to, ha to have used back then. And it gives you an idea of how their palate was different than ours. Um, mustard powder was basically heated in a white wine and sugar to make a syrup. And again, that really beautiful, oops. Again, that really beautiful um, apothecary jar. Um, apothecary jars could be very simple or they could be very ornate, depending on where you went and what period. Um, in the 16th century, they were beautiful. This is a 16th century apothecary jar. So the first pharmacopoeia. This is another resource for you. Um, the first Pharmacopoeia was the Ricettario Fiorentino, which is the Florentine recipe book. Um, it was an official publication from the Guild of Doctors and Apothecaries containing a list of drugs and the formulary of, their, of the ingredients and, and how you mix them, along with their effects and the directions for their use. Um, this was the beginning of the Pharmacopoeia tradition. Pharmacopoeia have been used since 1499, um, and you can find a lot of information in English in Pharmacopoeia from London. So if you did a Google search for the Pharmacopoeia that were produced in London in period, it's towards the end of our period, like late 1500s, um, you, you'd be able to, to see some of the recipes there. And you'd see how similar they are to the ones that we still use today. In fact, when I was researching cold cream, um, I went back and I looked into uh, Galen, the physician, Greco-Roman physician, and in his books, he had a recipe for cold cream. The same recipe I found in the 12th century and I found in the 15th century and the 16th century in Pharmacopoeia coming out of Italy. I, and I also found them in the London ones that came out at the end of the 16th century, 17th, 18th, 19th, the same, same basic recipe, very simple cold cream, was used throughout that entire period all the way until um, the early 1900s when um, Pond's cold cream began to, to make the recipe. And they changed it from one with olive oil and wax to um, paraffin and mineral oil. But I think there's a wealth of knowledge to be found in these pharmacopoeia. So if you're interested in health, hygiene, beauty, um, I would look in pharmacopoeia. That's one place that I would definitely start. So this next section is gonna talk about the different books that you would find um, recipes in that you can get started with yourself. So, Books of Secrets, Libri di Secreti. Books so of Secrets. A, a quick question. Um, wasn't the Circa Instans before this by Constantine the African? Oh yes, there were definitely pharmacopoeia. Oh, you know, I might have not said this particular sentence correctly. If I omitted saying in Europe, this is the first pharmacopoeia that we have in Europe, not in the entire world. Um, there were pharmacopoeia being written in Asia and Africa and the Middle East. 
from before 1499, definitely. So, um, books of secrets. Richitario or pharmacopoeia are one thing. They come from the guilds. They are used for medicinal and health and hygiene use. Books of secrets were more alchemical recipe books. Um, so this next section is going to talk about the books of secrets that I have studied and that you will have access to some even translated into English on sites like archive.org and Gutenberg that you can look at yourself, see the recipe, use that source, and, and create it yourself. Um, books of Secrets basically contain thousands of recipes from our period. Um, and when we're talking alchemy, we're talking things like met metallurgy, dyeing, ink making, um, soap making, perfume, oil, incense, uh, cosmetics. All of these things would be included in these Books of Secrets. And they were all written down by, you know, people who were pretty diligent at experimenting with herbal medicine, but people who were also involved in the, in the search for getting secrets from nature, specifically the secret of how to transform metal, common metal, into gold or silver, into precious metal. Um, so these books of secrets supplied practical information as well as some mystical arts. Uh, or information into mystical um, endeavors. Um, and this middle class readership that we found in the 15th and 16th century with a lot more people being literate and having the money to buy books and books being printed, this was the perfect storm to have, you know, like I said, thousands, literally thousands of recipes available. Um, and a lot of these books we still have today. Um, now if you remember the lady and the fresco that we that I showed you earlier from Valdosta, uh, the lady buying goods at the apothecary shop. Um, these were probably also, the, these recipes from Books of Secrets were also some of the recipes she would have been making. She would have had her own recipes um, that were very similar to the ones that were marketed in, in the Books of Secrets. For instance, in the book Segreti di Isabella Cortese, um, it was first printed in 1561 in Venice. And this is the first book that I studied. Uh, many of the ingredients would have been only able to have been procured at an ap apothecary shop. Um, there are 12 editions of this book that we know of that were printed between 1561 and 1677. Um, and what we have today is one of the original um, treatises. It's a book of about 200 pages. It's divided into three sections or three volumes. And it explains everything that you can think of as far as like alchemy, astrology, and also cosmetics and medicine. Um, the book is basically a collection of recipes and remedies um, for an immense variety of things. Um, for instance, the first book that was um, the first section included medical remedies for the plague uh, to help you recover from poison. So recipes for antidotes and also recipes to cure yourself of syphilis. Now we know that those things did not work, <laughs> especially drinking mercury to cure yourself of syphilis, but they were attempting to heal themselves and cure themselves of many different ailments and at some with a better success rate than others. Um, the second book contains processes for things like the preparation of ink, um, dyeing fabrics and leathers. Um, and the third book is dedicated to beauty, so it details recipes for creams, uh, perfumed water, actual oil perfumes and things like tooth cleanser, uh, lighten your hair, darken your hair, remove hair, help to make hair grow if it's fallen out, etc. Um, this photo that's on the slide is of one of the recipes for perfect royal oil and it was a perfumed oil that you could use to scent yourself and your clothes. This is another recipe from Isabella Cortez's Secrets. Um, and what we don't know is if Isabella Cortez, Cortez was a real person. Um, as you'll see in the next book, we know that certain people wrote books and then used the nom de plume. So they published under another name. And because a lot of these books were being used by the lady of the house, um, it's likely that the author was a man who just used a female nom de plume. Um, but this recipe here is to make the hands beautiful. So a farmani belly, and basically it's lemon juice, rose water that has stirred in powdered almond skins. So this was one of the first ones I translated, 
And literally the, the phrase that she used was the skin of the almond. So I did take off the almond skins. I don't know whether there's, there should be more oil in it or what, but to me now that I've been doing this for many years, I don't think that that was right. I think I missed something in the translation. But trial and error is something that teaches you valuable lessons. So when you start out with this, don't be afraid to make mistakes and then have to go back years later or months later or days later and say, you know what, I don't know if that was, especially if you're involved in translating, I don't know if that was exactly what she was trying to get across. Maybe I should make it again with this other thing and see if it works better. Now, when I did make this, I made this for an ANS, um, it really did moisturize your hands very beautifully because almond has natural oils in it. So I guess even though I just used the skin, it, it gave enough of a, a pleasant feeling and smell to my hands that I was happy. But I actually now want to go back and look at the original recipe again and see the phrase that she used and see if I can drill down to a better interpretation of what she meant by the skin of the almond. And if any of you have any ideas, please let me know. Next, we're going to talk about Alessio Piemontese. So in 1555, Alessio um, published a book and now we, we know that it was published by, or we think that it was published by Girolamo Russoli. So a book was published in the name of Alessio Piedmont, um, and this is the English title that you can search for on, like I said, archive.org or gutenberg.org, and you can find an English translation of the book, The Secrets of the Reverend Meister Alexis of Piedmont. And this is the full title, containing excellent remedies against the diverse diseases, wounds, and other accidents with a manner to make distillations, perfumes, comforters, dyes, colors, fusions, and meltings a work well approved, very necessary for every man. So these, like I said, they were being marketed to people. So there was not just the title of the book. It was, there was more information, kind of like the blurbs that we use today to pull you in and make you think that you were getting, you know, this really great value and all these really amazing secrets that you couldn't come by yourself. I will say that much like the, what I've heard from people who study cooking, Sometimes something is left out of the, the recipe so that you don't have all the knowledge of the people who actually come up with these recipes. So again, if you make something that doesn't come out right, use conjecture. Think about what could be missing. There was a, um, in this book, there is a, a face whitener um, that's just liquid and oil. There's no like emulsifier to bind it together. So for me, I made it just as it was written and I also made it using wax as a pseudo emulsifier to see if that would help it go on better. And I think it did. So um, like I said, when you try these, be, don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to use conjecture. Um, next slide. Oh, that's not the way I wanted to go. Okay. The next one is also from Alessio and it is soap with roses. So it's basically telling you buy a very fine Venetian soap, a fine white Venetian soap, um, grate it and incorporate fresh roses with it and let it dry. So I found a similar recipe in three different books of secrets. And basically it's, you take soap, you grate it, you chop it, you incorporate rose petals with it. A lot of times you use a little bit of rose water, orange flower water to make little balls and let them dry in the sun. And then you can use it as a soap that has rose petals in it. So it has not only the smell of rose petals, but we know now that rose oil is good for redness of the face, scarring, um, wrinkles, etc. So that is a very easy recipe to make. And the fine Venetian soap would have been Castile soap, type of Castile soap. And you can find that at your market. Um, okay. Olio Imperiale. This was one of my favorite recipes to come across and make because it was a beard oil. And I had never thought about um, when I first started out, you know, products for men. But of course, people want to look and smell good and that men are no exception to that. So this is an oil. And again, the title is like five, five of our sentences long, but it's one very long run on sentence. And it talks about, among other things, this oil is great to perfume the hair or beard of a man to rub his hands or gloves with. It also goes in to talk about how you can use it to scent your clothes, use it to scent um, your washing water for clothes, 
and that every great man or prince deserves this type of water to be used or this type of oil to be used for this amazing scent. And it is an amazing scent, largely due to the fact that there are things like ambergris, musk and civet, along with rose water and damask rose oil and cloves and cinnamon. It's a really beautifully um, balanced beard oil and a very light scent, um, but very complex. I didn't read any of my notes for that one. I'm sorry. Let me see. I don't think I missed anything though. I, like I said, this is one of my favorite recipes and next time I'm in on tier, I probably will have some with me. So if you run into me, not likely, right? But Ah, yeah, if no one I'm on here, I won't run into you, probably for the foreseeable future. So in the, foresee in the unforeseeable future, whenever we do get back to events, please ping me. And if I'm going to be in an event that you're going to be at and I have some of this with me, I'll let you smell it. The next thing we're going to talk about is um, an aqua odorifera. So this is a, um, you would think it's odorous water, but it's more like a perfumed water. And this is the Satima one, so it's the seventh. So in the series of recipes for this type of perfumed water, he had, you know, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. This is the seventh perfumed water. And, and it's very, you know, pretty simple. Take four pounds of citrus water, take two pounds of damask rose water, half a scruple of amber and mix together. And if you, if you mix that together and let it sit maybe uh, on a ledge in a window in the sun, for a day, it will infuse very nicely. And then you can use it to scent yourself, scent your chemise, scent your shift. Um, you could also use it as a hand washing water um, because it would have some properties to, to cleanse your hands. Um, I think the rest of this recipe says to mix it together, put into a lidded vessel, leave in the sun for a month and then use as you will. I don't know if I would leave it for a whole month. I probably would just put it in direct sunlight in New Orleans for a day or two um, and then put it in the fridge. Let's see, what, it, what is meant here by Amber? I actually can see some of the comments, so that's good. Um, so Amber is ambergris. When, whenever they say Amber in these 15th and 16th century books of secrets, they mean ambergris. The next um, book of secrets is actually what um, is known as the experiments, Li Experimenti by Caterina Sforza. This is my ultimate all time favorite lady of the Renaissance to study. And the fact that she also had a book about chemical secrets is just, it's icing on the top of the cake. So this first recipe um, is to make the face uh, the most white and beautiful and glowing or light and uh, color colorful, but not colorful, like, uh, like the, the redness of your cheeks, you know, like a, t like a, hmm, I can't think of a way to, to translate colorita. But when I think of it before the end of this uh, talk, I will tell you. Um, so Katarina wrote this book probably from 1480 to about 1509. She compiled all of her experiments. Her, it was her still room book that she wrote in her own hand. And um, shortly after her death, her son, who was a well-known mercenary soldier, Condottieri, Giovanni della Bandanera, he sent one of his captains to search for this particular handwritten book of his mother's because he wanted it published. Um, and I think that that speaks to the fact that he was, um, that he loved his mother and he wanted some part of her to live on. And so even though he was this big, bad mercenary soldier, he was like, hey, go find this book. I know it's somewhere. <laughs> find it, transcribe it, get it published. Um, I want my mother, I want my mother to live on into history. And of course, um, Giovanni della Bandanera was the father of Cosimo, the first Grand Duke of, of Tuscany. So her, her, she did live on. She, she, her bloodline is part of the royal houses of Europe to this day. Um, so let's see, this next one is, this one is to turn, to heal the redness of the face. So it's take white lead, rose water, violet oil, and mix together and anoint the face. So when I started out, what I would do is I would take each of these words and I would go to John Florio's 
um, dictionary, Italian English dictionary of 1590 something, 1598. And I would look up each word. And as you, even if you don't speak Italian, even if you don't speak a foreign language, after doing this a couple 20, 30 times, <laughs> you start to remember what the words are. Um, and, and they get kind of cemented in your brain. And so when you're looking at a recipe, you understand uh, pilia means take, and you understand cerusa is white lead, and you understand aqua rosa is rose water, uh, and you understand oleo de viole is violet oil. Um, but then you can take it a step further, and you can put in those terms and find out the, what the, <laughs> I can't remember that word either. So you can put those terms into, oh, herbals, but herbal books. <laughs> uh, 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 I can't remember. Yeah, it's gone. So sometimes I spaz out during these classes, but if I remember this word too, by the end of the class, I will tell you what it is. But books like Mattioli's Herbal, Gerard's Herbal, those books have information on these plants that give you the scientific name of them and give you an idea of what they look like. So when you're trying to match up, the ingredients to something and what you can buy commonly modernly, you can make a better decision because some things that we use as far as like violet flowers, um, if you try to buy dried violet petals or dried rose petals, those roses might be new world species. And you wanna make sure that you get um, the equivalent of what they would have used in Europe during our period. So the next one is to make the odors of the mouth end, basically. And so this one tells us to take cedar. And so in the corner, I also have a picture from one of the herbals. I think this is from Gerard's herbal. Um, so you take cedar, nutmeg, uh, carnation, and sage. You pulverize them, so you grind them up. You incorporate them with wine, and you take them before dinner, and then also after you eat the food. Um, so when I looked at this one, I found the word garofani was um, carnation, and I thought that was really strange because I don't know why you would um, put carnation in anything. I didn't know it had any good medicinal properties or, or um, odor, odor properties at all. But the, the carnation they would have had back then is the one that's in the picture from the herbal, and it's called um, clove pink or gilly flower. And it actually has the scent of cloves. I guess what we have now in florist shops are unscented carnations. But back then, they had this type of carnation they call the clove pink. And it's also called the gillyflower. And it smells like cloves. And that makes sense to me because cloves are something people use even now to freshen their breath. So that is the function of the carnation in this recipe. It's also a pretty simple recipe if you wanted to try like a mouthwash um, for bad breath that's made from wine. I don't know why you wouldn't drink it, but. So this is the, my last slide. Um, my sources are listed here, but I'll also make sure that when we post this on the YouTube channel, that if I can think of any other sources that I used, um, that I add that to the, the blurb on YouTube. And again, my name is Jata. So hold on, let me go back to the first slide. I, you can find me under this name on Facebook. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to, to ping me, to contact me. Um, I'll answer it to the best of my abilities. And if I don't know, I probably know someone who does know. I'm just kind of waiting to see if anybody has any questions. Okay. Give them a minute. <laughs> I don't see any questions. Okay. Well, if you think of any later, um, please let, let me know. Almonds come in a fruit. Is that the skin of the almond? Maybe it's fruit. Maybe. That's a good idea. Mm. That's a thought. Pottery were their standard forms. Um, so if we look at, you mean like the apothecary jars, the those jars? If you look at the, the pictorial evidence that we have of what Albrelli looked like and then the ones that have survived to this day, they were tall, cylindrical. They could have some curve to them. I think that was easy, to make it easier to handle. Um, 
they usually had some type of indication on the outside of it of what it was. The one, the ones on the shelf here and this uh, miniature have like heraldry on them. I'm not sure what that was for, but obviously there was some kind of, you know, there was some kind of significance to each symbol on, on the apothecary jar. Um, but when you look at, let's see, these, these are much larger. They're much rounder. We also have some that have depictions of it being sealed on top with like waxed linen. Um, let's see. When you look at this one, like I said, tall, cylindrical, it has like a curve here that probably would make it better to, um, to hold. And then the top has kind of a lip. So I, my conjecture and other people's conjecture and books that I've read is that those wax linen tops would then be sealed with some type of twine or rope or string um, to, to seal the top. Um, and then you can see the ones in the back of this picture as well. Some are shorter and some are, are kind of round, but, I, but the ones that are round, um, I don't know if you can see, I don't know how large the picture is on your screen, but that's a water. So ones that held liquids that were runny were probably a different shape than ones who held things like syrups and um, electuaries and dried herbs. If you type in Alborello, Alborelli, there are tons of pictures at museums of ones that have survived to this day. And I'll give you a good idea of the different types that, are, that were out there in period. All right. That's all the questions I see. Well, thank you guys for giving me this chance to talk to you. Um, like I said, sometimes I get flustered during classes and forget words and forget things. But if I remember later, I will make sure to post a note on the YouTube video as well.